This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. It's Fun Friday. My name is Jeff Sandu. When you sit back and look at everything that happened in 2018, you might think there's not much to look forward to in 2019. Not true, reckons Culture Pop's Matt Armitage. This is a great time to be alive. It's time he explained. Matt, you're really full of hope for 2019 then, huh? Yeah, I am. Uh, I know things look a little bit dark right now. Mm. The world economy seems to be, I don't know, blowing up a bit. The uh, planet is doing its best to exterminate us. And we've got madmen in charge. But you have to look at the positives. The bezels on our phones are getting so, so small. <laughs> the world is going to hell in a handbasket and you're happy with screen technology. Well, actually, on a personal level, no, <laughs> I'm not because um, OLED and AMOLED screens give me blinding headaches. So mm-hmm. I've still got to search for the small number of LCD screen phones that are still out there. Luckily, Apple, being a generation or two behind most phone manufacturers, still has quite a lot of uh, LCD screen models but you are literally buying less for a lot more money, uh, especially when it comes to working Bluetooth, which none of my devices seem to have this week. You are an interesting creature. But anyways, why is this making you happy? Because this is still the greatest time to be alive. Um, How many of your relatives died of smallpox or plague last year? None, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, In fact, we've become so blasé about medicine that preventable deaths from diseases like measles are actually increasing because we're too caught up in the unfounded conspiracy theories about linking vaccines to autism. I'm still not getting the happiness. Well, we've finally got the luxury of not saving the people we love. Um, It's not much more than a few decades ago that we would have given anything we could to a doctor to cure our loved ones. Now that so many diseases are actually treatable... We can choose to go to websites selling crystals instead of going to see doctors. You do have a very strange way of looking at things. Because we live in an amazing time. You know, we have almost every fact in the world instantly searchable at our fingertips. We have machines that are doing most of the hard work for us. Transport that's reliable, fast and rarely breaks down. In most places, there's an abundance of cheap food. We have, by all measures of human experience a pretty wonderful life. Okay, so why don't things seem so great? Because we haven't adapted to all of these changes yet. You know, our brains are reeling from all that information and trying to figure out what's true. And the things that are true are often really complicated. So it's easier to believe simple things that are untrue, Mm -hmm. like the world being flat, (laughs) um, or that vaccination programs are part of a secret world conspiracy to make George Soros, the secret Sith Lord in Star Wars, ruler of the world. But it's still incredible that we can believe in nonsense and for the most part, no one is trying to kill us. Okay, let's help everyone see the world through your kaleidoscope goggles. Let's start with social media and the big tech companies. Why are their failings a good thing? Because the false gods have fallen away from our eyes. Um, During the first dot-com boom, we venerated companies like Yahoo and AOL and MySpace. We weren't really that focused on the people that ran them. You know, Tom from MySpace was just a thing. Mm. Um, Steve Jobs, of course, has a lot to do with changing that mindset. And suddenly the founder has become the company. Didn't we do the same with Bill Gates and Microsoft? I don't think we did to the same degree. And that was largely um, because the public were trying to conflate the two. I mean, look at how successfully Bill Gates has negotiated his post-Microsoft phase. Mm. We wanted him to personify the brand, but really he was just running the company. And when he left... Other people have been running the company ever since. But when you look at Tim Cook, he's been running Apple for seven years and we still say stuff like, well, that would never have happened if Steve Jobs was still in charge. We don't look at Satya Nadella and say, well, what would Bill Gates have done? Mm, mm. So Jobs was Apple in most people's eyes and that's become the model of the tech boss in the noughties and the teens. So... You know, most of us can't think about Facebook without picturing Mark Zuckerberg or Tesla without thinking about Elon Musk. And you're saying that the scandals are a good thing? Not exactly. I mean, that would mean I was one of the lords of (laughs) chaos that are profiting from this transition phase. Um, The scandals obviously are a terrible thing, but there are byproducts of lax and lazy lawmaking and, of course, from us believing the hype. 
uh, the hype that these guys were going to deliver us all from tyranny and oppression and poverty and lead us into a world of leisure and wealth and knowledge. And as history has shown, and as Malaysia proved in uh, 2018, other people aren't going to give you freedom. They're not going to deliver change for you. People deliver themselves from tyranny when they reject the lies and they discard the people that treated them with contempt in the first place. So what's the upside of everything that's going on at Facebook? Well, it's been a while since I got on my, uh, high, ho- my <laughs> high horse about how we pay for these sites. You know, I think a lot of people are starting to see that the free-to-use ad-funded model doesn't really work. And people won't pay. They don't want to pay, but TV was traditionally one of those things that people didn't want to pay for. Now, how much time do we spend watching free-to-air TV? Oh, I spend none. None, exactly. Um, we have cable, we have Netflix, Amazon, HBO, depending on you know where in the world you live. Uh, music services like Spotify and Apple Music are chipping away at a different end of the resistance towards paying for content. Yeah, there's still a lot of resistance, though. But if you said to someone in the 1970s that they would have to pay not only for a TV set and for the content they watched, they would probably have laughed in your face because the business model then was free to air. It isn't anymore. Um, And is it any more difficult to change our mindset to social media than it was to change our mindset to TV? Because still, Mm -hmm. most people spend more time watching TV than they do watching social media. I know it's kind of close now. Um, But Facebook is free to use because that was the prevailing Internet model at the time. That was the time when we thought about the long tail and the belief that, you know, you'd be able to fly around the world for (laughs) nothing as long as you watched enough ads on the in-flight TV screens. But that model and that world has changed. And you think the mood is changing? Yeah, because people have finally woken up to the value of the data they produce. Um, Look at the generation of kids that isn't signing up to Facebook and the other social media Mm. sites. They know the value of that data. They keep that data behind encrypted walls and only share a vision of their lives that they want the world to see. And finally, the older generations are kind of getting this as well. Facebook is free to use, but that doesn't make it good value. You are worth more to them. uh, And waking up to that value is fundamental to forcing the site to change its business model. Uh, So what would you like to see them do in 2019? I would like uh, Facebook and a lot of the other social media services to introduce a paid tier, which is free of advertising and uh, algorithm focused incentives, Uh, because right now, you know, Facebook has to keep us on the site as much as possible. Otherwise, they're not going to make any money. More time on the site means the more ads we see and the more targeted content we consume. But I think they should be treating it more like a gym membership. Mm. Give us enough bait that we sign up and continue paying, but not so much that we want to spend more time there than is strictly necessary. Like LinkedIn. Well, yeah, increasingly with LinkedIn, there isn't that much you can do without giving them some money. Um, I'm not a big fan of the site. It, It isn't fun enough for me. And and I guess it's not supposed to be. Mm. Um, I prefer sites that lend itself lend themselves to content creation like Medium. But as a business model, I think LinkedIn works. You pay for what you need and you spend only as much time on the site as is necessary. And it is a business site. So it's kind of right that we treat it like work. You write on Medium, don't you? Uh, Yes, and I deliver most of my content there behind the paywall. Um, Not because I've got such a a huge audience that I'm raking (laughs) it in, but because I think the things I write and the other authors I read on the site have value. So even if it doesn't really benefit me, I think it's better to put it behind that paywall. And how do you deal with the cost aspect? Surely we can't afford to pay for absolutely everything. Well, it's weird, isn't it? Um, when we talk about going online, we say we can't afford to do everything. You would never dream of walking up to the register in a supermarket with a completely overfull trolley and telling the cashier that you uh, were taking everything but could only afford to pay for a box of tea bags. <laughs> You're so English, yeah. Okay, a packet of Maggie then. But, Uh you know, no one would do that. But that's what we do on the internet every day. Um, 
what this Facebook nonsense has done is reintroduce that concept of value. It's made people wake up to the fact that they aren't Facebook's customers, that Facebook isn't working in their interests, and that they're getting a really bad deal. I'm sounding like Donald Trump right now. <laughs> um, people aren't happy that their personal information is being turned over to third parties to use who knows how, or that their feeds are being manipulated by intermediaries of foreign government. Those things impose a really high social cost on users. But that realisation, I think, is probably going to have a much more consequential financial impact for Facebook. And hopefully it'll be one that nudges it towards models that protect us more. Um, or they're going to find that we're doing what all the kids are doing, and that's desert the site for encrypted private messaging services. Mm. It's a strange reason to be cheerful as we head into the break. But that change is really necessary. You know, you can kind of think of uh, 2017 and 2018 as being a bit like lying in bed with food poisoning or a migraine. 2019, I hope, is when we'll start feeling a bit better. You know, you open the curtains, you see the blue sky shining through, and you start thinking about what you're going to do with this lovely day. Probably the happiest thing you've ever said in 2018. Anyways, we'll go for a short break while I try to readjust what Matt just said. We'll be coming back uh, with more of Matt's Stranger Reasons of Being Cheerful in 2019, BFM 89.9. Banish feudal mentality, BFM 89.9. The Business Station. And we're back. My name is Jeff Sander, together with Culture Pop's Matt Armitage. Before the break, we were looking at some of Matt's stranger reasons for being cheerful in 2018. Uh, so, Matt, why else are you happy with the world of technology as we head into the new year? Amazon, actually. Um, <laughs> another one of our popular episodes last year was uh, episode 31, which was Amazon's Age of Empire. And that was another one where people thought I was making a bit too much of a fuss. Mm. And then with their HQ2 proposal, hundreds of US cities started competing with each other to build Amazon a brand new campus. So I framed it as uh, Game of Thrones because, you know, Amazon was always going to be the winner. But a lot of other pundits compared it to the Hunger Games, making cities fight to the death for the chance of, you know, some food from the retail giant. And you're happy that Amazon turned the US on its head. Well, again, this is another one of those uh, pulling the wool from the eyes type moments. You know, we hear a lot about the sweetheart deals that uh, big companies are offered by governments or councils or municipal bodies when they offer to build a plant or a campus in a, a new location. This is especially common in the tech industry because staff are often highly skilled and highly paid. And the idea is that money will flood into the surrounding areas and more than pay for the sugar lumps that the company's been given. And these deals aren't a secret. No, they're definitely not. You know, everyone likes to think of these things as being conspiracies and plots and uh, being cooked up behind closed doors. And they aren't. They're there. They're in plain sight. There's nothing underhand about them. Mm. But that doesn't make them ethical or moral. Uh, so it was good that uh, the Amazon deal became a national news story mm. uh, because at one point the media were even reporting where <laughs> Jeff Bezos' plane was headed to next. Mm. So that exposure has brought more awareness of the enormous sums of money that big companies are given that effectively subsidise their cost of business. Yeah, exposure is one thing, but why should this make us happy? How will it change anything? Well, people often ask how companies like Amazon manage to sell stuff so cheaply. We see the glamorous campus in a prestigious location, the slick websites, the customer-friendly AI. We don't look at the flip side that uh, makes some of these companies so profitable, mm. the tax breaks they get, the offshoring, the questionable working conditions, and often paying people minimum wages, even though the company's doing very well. So HQ2 lifted another part of the lid into that world. People want to know why their taxes are subsidising big companies to the tune of billions of dollars. It's not just a few well-meaning journalists howling into the wind anymore. People are starting to understand how much the low prices are actually costing them in terms of taxes and uh, lost uh, employment costs mm. in the long run. And doesn't that just mean fewer jobs and more automation? Or are you cheerful about that too? Well, one of the few things about the rise of populism, whether it's techno-populism or political populism, is that it holds these organisations to account. Look at the US government shutdown. <laughs> you can't find much happy about that, right? Well, these are very strange times, and I'm the kind of person that strange <laughs> times were made for. So... 
Media was reporting that a deal had been reached and a shutdown would be averted, but there was an outcry from Trump's base that he was caving in with no money for his wall. And that base is the reason for the shutdown. Still not seeing the happy. Okay, I mean, this isn't a show about populism (laughs) or its inherent dangers, but in a way it is about participatory democracy and the will of the people, Mm. if only a smallish bunch of them. What we're seeing across the spectrum is a realisation by people that they have power and agency, that the people they elect or the companies they use work for them. Are we heading somewhere more cheerful now? I think we can see where you're heading. I'm not sure if the happy ever after is guaranteed, though. Well, younger listeners might not remember this from the end of the uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. That's all, folks. Okay, so that idea, that's all, folks, that kind of sums up the relationship we've had with technology companies over the last 20 years. They invent it, they release it, they tell us how it's going to be. They forget that we're the ones who are supposed to tell them how it is. So part of the backlash a lot of companies are feeling right now is that realisation that that's all, folks, doesn't work for us anymore. And that the folks who have been happy are the wrong folks. The shareholders? Well, yeah, a lot of companies seem to have considered their share prices to be the holy grail, that shareholders' needs come first. They forget that the money that they give to those shareholders comes from people like us. This is your farm analogy. Uh, Yes, the idea of social media companies being a farm and rather than us being the customers, we're the cattle that are looked after and fed by the farmer so that he can sell us on to the real customers who are the data mining companies and their clients and shareholders. The thing is, we aren't cattle and those companies haven't done enough to take care of us. So even if you subscribe to the idea of benevolent patricianship, those companies have failed in their duty of care to us. And the people that aren't their customers are starting to realise that they should be their customers. And that's one of the things that makes me optimistic about 2019. So if I've got this right, you're even happy about the DNA modded babies that were announced in China last month? Yeah, because, you know, (laughs) DNA hacking is something we've covered on the show Mm. a fair bit this year. And it's ferociously hard to understand the science behind it, which is one of the reasons that most people try not to think about it too much. However, it is really easy to do, even if you don't have much background knowledge. It's a bit like following the recipe for a particularly difficult cake. Yeah, your first few times you're going to mess it up. But eventually you'll make a passable or at least edible version of the cake, you know, at some point. Mm. Uh, I'm not happy that we have designer babies, but I'm pleased that we have to have the conversations about designer babies. Mm. With technology, the whole social media and fake news nonsense... um, Part of the reason behind it is that we've had our heads in the sand. The technology zips along, but we have refused to talk about the implications. And that really annoys you, doesn't it? Uh, It does, yeah, because I'm, you know, kind of focused on the future. But I'm trying to imagine what the world will look like uh, with all these competing technologies in it. And, of course, trying to figure out what technologies will come next. So, yeah, sometimes it does feel like I'm playing a game of I told you so some (laughs) of the time and I'm happy to say that I am often wrong especially about some of the darker stuff we talk about on the show but that's what today is all about. People choosing to pull back from the darker stuff. Yes so earlier you asked me am I happy about automation and yes I am I'm happy about automation I'm happy about AI I'm happy about gene research quantum computing nanotech blockchain the collapse of cryptocurrencies renewable energy I'm happy about all of these things. What I'm not happy about are the politicians who regulate those industries or the companies that are trying to control them or the people who think it's too hard to think or talk about these subjects. And you think we're ready for these conversations? No, I absolutely think we aren't (laughs) ready for these conversations, but I think we're starting to realise that we have to have the conversations whether we're ready or not and that we need political and social leaders who are up to the task of having those conversations. I think we've all seen the huge gap between some of the lawmakers and the tech companies that they are supposed to regulate. Yeah, uh, a couple of weeks ago, one uh, US congressman (laughs) uh, seriously asked Google's CEO about a game on his granddaughter's iPhone and had to be told that they were made by a different company. He then admitted that he didn't know if his granddaughter's phone was an (laughs) Apple or an Android device. 
And we laugh, but mm. these people pass laws that affect hundreds of millions, even billions of people. So this year we saw the introduction of the most sweeping data laws and controls that the world has seen so far. And the GDPR in the EU. Yeah, and because so many companies trade globally, pretty much everyone who's online is now GDPR compliant, even if they're not within the European Union. But those regulations haven't protected us all from all of these data breaches and uh, selling stuff to third parties this year. As I've said before, GDPR is the best set of technology regulations that the year 2014 could have had. Mm. But they're not up to the task of governing 2018, which is the year of their introduction. Again, struggling to see the silver lining there. Because up to now, nobody cared. Uh, would it have been better if these regulations had been put in place years ago? Yeah, obviously. At least now we can all see the gap between the world of law and the world of technology. And as troubling as that is, it is an essential step that's needed if we're going to get anything fixed. I think it's time we started asking people what they know about technology. We have to ask political candidates to explain the difference between Android and iOS. <laughs> Make them tell you how the internet works. And if they can't, then give your vote to someone who can, because we don't owe these people a living. It's all that simple. It's not simple at all. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've been... Uh, talking on the show for the last couple of years that, and saying that, you know, we've been waltzing into the dark. The future isn't set, it isn't certain, but we do have to be able to trust the people who are supposed to be working to secure that future for us. Let's talk about automation again. Uh, if robots do put most people out of work, then we're going to have to have societies and economic systems that will allow people to have a sense of purpose and a decent standard of living, even if they don't have what we now look at as jobs. Those systems will be radically new and they will be unlike anything we've seen before. And that's a very strange reason to be cheerful. I don't think it is. You know, <laughs> until now, we've trusted other people to make those decisions for us. Uh, for companies, it's far more profitable, certainly in the short term, to ignore what we need and want while selling us the lie that they're user-focused. I'm cheerful because we're finally making them listen to us. It's not exactly storming the Bastille, <laughs> but at the top of tech, some heads are starting to roll. Well, if that has made you cheerful for 2019, you can get in touch with Matt Amatich uh, on Twitter, <laughs> which is cheerful at yeah. cheerful Matt or something yeah, like my, that. <laughs> my Twitter address is at Jeff Sandu. <laughs> You can let us know at BFM Radio. Uh, that is all for this year. Matt will be back next year. Sounds like a long time, but it isn't. Also, we will be back for Geek Squawks after this because we will be looking at some of the tech stories, uh, some of the things that happened throughout 2018. Uh, Matt has called these things that make you go ooh and things that make you go boo. boo. <laughs> we'll be right back. BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.